Our top focus this hour. The United States President Joe Biden is in Tokyo for the second leg of his Asia visit, where he will be attending a host of key meets with allies including the Fourth Quad Summit. In a bid to boost U.S. strategic presence in the Indo-Pacific, aimed at countering increasing China threat in the region. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida welcomed U.S. President Joe Biden to the country in a special ceremony where the military honor guard played the anthems of both countries in welcome following which the two leaders held bilaterals on the agenda was Indo-Pacific, Ukraine as well as multinational trade pact that Biden is slated to unveil later today. Prime Minister Kishida called deepening ties between the two countries to ensure a quote-unquote free and open Indo-Pacific. While the United States President reinstated American commitment to Japan's defense and ensuring stability and protecting democracies in the region, the two nations are also expected to discuss Japan's plans to expand its military capabilities during the bilaterals and reach in response to China's growing might. The U.S.-Japanese alliance has... Uh long been the cornerstone of peace and prosperity in the Indo-Pacific. And the United States remains fully committed to Japanese, Japan's defense, and we will face the challenges of today and the future together. The two leaders also spoke about the ongoing Ukraine war. President Joe Biden thanked Japan for its stance against Russia and said that Putin must be held accountable for the war crimes committed in Ukraine. In a strong statement, Prime Minister Kishida also said that the powers in no way can allow for change of status quo by force in any part of the world. Russia による Ukraine ま侵略は国際秩序の根幹を揺るがすものであり、このような力による一方的な現状変更の試みは世界のどこであっても絶対に認められないと考えています。The two leaders also discussed the multinational trade pact that Biden will launch later today. The Indo-Pacific Economic Framework of the IPEF is a program to bind countries closer through common standards in various areas, including supply chain resilience, clean energy, infrastructure and digital trade. The IPEF is unlikely to include binding commitments. Remember, the United States currently lacks economic pact in its engagement in the region after former President Donald Trump withdrew from a multinational trans-Pacific trade agreement in 2017. Earlier in the day, Joe Biden met with Japanese Emperor as well, Naruhito, at the Imperial Palace, and the two leaders exchanged greetings wearing masks before holding talks at the palace. White House said Biden offered greetings on behalf of the American people, highlighting the strength of the U.S.-Japan relationship, anchored by deep people-to-people -people ties. Tomorrow, Biden will attend the meeting of the Quad Grouping along with leaders of other member states, India, Japan, Australia, before departing for the United States. And for more on this, joining us live right now from Tokyo is Professor James D.J. Brown, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science at Temple University. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, my first question to you is, uh, how do you assess the significance of the summit between the Quad leaders? We know what that it is happening in the backdrop of the war in Ukraine. There's also an emphasis on economic frameworks, cooperation. What are your expectations? So with the, the Quad summit, I think the, the emphasis is definitely going to be uh, that this is a uh, an active and uh, reanimated uh, grouping of countries. Earlier this year, there were some concerns that uh, the Quad might be somewhat at risk. And the reason for this is that clearly there wasn't agreement on the issue of, of Russia's invasion of Ukraine with India taking rather a different stance. So I think one of the priorities for uh, the Japanese hosts is to uh, to demonstrate that despite those differences, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, there is very much agreement that the Quad remains active and that it's moving forward in new areas. And I think as, as well as the US's uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework, it's interesting to see that it seems likely that there's going to be agreement on a new mechanism for tracking illegal fishing in the region as well. So some new areas that the Quad is moving into. Right, absolutely. Also, when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, like you mentioned, and China's growing influence, what do you think could be the Quad's next steps? I, I think it very much is um, to, 
uh, to add some further substance. So originally, there was some criticism of the quad for, for being a, a talking shop. Uh, but if they can actually add more kind of substance to it by uh, genuine initiatives like the one on tracking illegal fishing, uh, perhaps with some additional things to do with setting uh, common standards in the digital economy to do with infrastructure, that would add something more. The main missing part at the moment, however, is when it comes to the US's economic engagement. Uh, for a country such as Japan, it was a huge disappointment. Uh, it was seen as a major strategic mistake by the United States not to join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. At the moment, it seems that the Indo-Pacific economic framework is very much a second best, but still, uh, for countries like Japan, they welcome the United States um, you know, adding to the economic element because at the moment, uh, it's the, the US and its allies are lagging far behind China in just the levels of investment in Southeast Asia and other parts of the Indo-Pacific. Right, absolutely. And just another major point here is the discussions between the United States and Japan on expanding Japan's military capabilities. Now, what is your assessment of that? So I think it's best to see this as an acceleration. So uh, Japan famously has its, its peace constitution, Article 9, which prevents it from going to war. But over the subsequent decades, there's been a gradual erosion of that, with Japan doing more, uh, becoming a more capable ally of the United States. But with Russia's invasion of Ukraine, it's really driven home to Japanese policymakers the extent of Japan's insecurity. Uh, at one point, it could rely exclusively on the United States. That was enough. Now the US is still seen as an absolutely vital partner, but Japan needs to do more itself. So that process of Japan um, really becoming more of a kind of normal security actor, stretching the bounds of those constitutional restraints and moving into new areas, that's really moving forward more quickly. And so the thing to, in particular, look out for is Japan increasing its defense spending, taking it up to uh, around 2% of GDP, and also uh, developing capabilities such as counter-strike capabilities to actually hit targets in foreign countries. All right. Well, Professor James D. Gibran, thank you so much for joining us with your analysis of this. Beyond is now available in your country. Download the app now. Get all the news on the move.